Fighting Withers. Fighting Withers? <laughs> COVID's got me playing Minecraft again a little bit. We, I've stopped a little bit now, but we, we played a little bit. I was like, we started a server. I'm like, oh, we should build this mountain. And then like, oh, we should do it. And it sort of snowballed to where we had like nine, ten of us on this server. And we're like, damn, COVID's done this to us. We good. We love. Yeah. Um, what's up, everybody? My name's Indy. And the gentleman right next to me, that's Mr. Jay Powell from Powell Group Consulting. And this is Indie Game Business. And today we have Alex Beddoes with us. And we're talking about um what what were the what was your, your mantra that you were saying earlier? <laughs> uh as I was saying, yeah, yeah, I work toward whenever I talk to people about careers and developing careers, it's always Self-awareness of being deliberate is kind of the two things I always think about whenever I'm working on doing career things. Self-awareness and and you and you are the uh, content manager for ArtStation, right? Yeah, for the learning content. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, Excellent. Welcome to the show, Alex. The tell us a little bit about tell us how you got into the industry initially and walk us through your career up to this point. Um, okay, so I've had quite a weird, my career has been very odd. Um, so early on, like around the age of like 16, 17, um, I was still pursuing, I was playing professional rugby um, and I thought I was going to play professional sport for a living. Um, on the side, I was still like, you know, I was learning software, but in my evenings um, and, you know, sport doesn't pay great unless you're like playing for your country or something. <laughs> So like at the so I was basically like doing all my training and stuff for professional sport, but then I was also working as like a bricklayer, um, laboring and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then in my evenings, I'm train myself. And basically, at the age of nineteen, uh, I got offered a gig uh, straight out of college for a uh, doing serious games. Uh, serious games being you know using game technology for learning purposes mainly or training purposes, non entertainment. Um, so I had to make a decision. It was kind of like, do I keep pushing to try and be a professional sportsman or do I, you know, take this whole game career thing seriously? Um, I kind of knew I wasn't going to make, you know, make it as a, as a sports person. So I was like, okay, uh, let's do this then. So I ended up like kind of quitting the whole grind for pro rugby. I was still playing semi-professional, um, but I wouldn't take it anywhere near as seriously as I was. Um, yeah, and I bounced around a bit. I was uh, I did a year there, and then I went to a mobile game studio uh, called SGS. Um, I then moved into iGaming. It's, it's really weird. So basically, SGS went under. Um, I couldn't get funding. The company went under. And I was looking for work. I was struggling to find work. And I got an offer from a game studio who do iGaming, like um, casino games, gambling. And... The recruiter rang me and was like, "Do you want to? Do you want to? Are you interested?" I was like, "I don't really. I, no, not really. <laughs> uh, but I'll go to the interview anyway. I'm desperate, so I'll go." And they showed me the art, and the art was actually like it was really interesting. Like, it was a completely different perception to what I had. So I thought I, you know, gambling was like you know, gold, Vegas, roulette wheels, blackjack. Um, it was more about like mobile slots, and they looked more like mobile games. They were like they're really you know, quite fun designs. They were fun to work on. So I ended up staying in our gaming for a couple of years um, and it ended up becoming quite good for me because after Inspired, I moved my, my lead moved to another studio and I kind of followed him. Um, I went there to be the principal artist and it was kind of, I had to, I had opportunities elsewhere. I had opportunities at CD Projekt Red. This was in 2018. I had opportunities at CD Projekt Red and Machine Games and um, a couple of Ubisoft studios. And what ended up happening I had this live five opportunity and they were like, look, we get it. We get you want to work in AAA, but working with us, you'll be able to like get a lot of business experience because being an artist in, or, or like a designer in iGaming, it's a lot more client facing. You have to um, interact with people, meet the customers, pitch everything. So it was very, it was kind of like, okay, I get to like develop my business side of me a little bit more. If I, uh, if I go to live five, um, so I went there. Uh, I still wanted to work in AAA, so I got the opportunity to work as a lead artist at Decagon and Outsource Studio. Um, so I was doing both of them at the same time. I was doing. Uh, I was getting up at like half five, getting to work at six, 
work until two o'clock, coming home, and then working on deck again until like 10 that night. Uh, so I was basically doing two jobs. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move. I, I sort of did, I was commuting an hour to Stafford. I was based in Coventry. The commute to Stafford was an hour um, drive and then an hour back. So it's quite a lot. I did that for a year and a half and I was, I, I was sort of ready for a move and ended up um, our station reaching out. Our station needed someone to manage their 3D learning content. Um, I knew them anyway. I've interacted with them in the past. They came on a podcast. So ended up joining them. Um, I was still working for Decagon. You know, I, I, you can sort of work as much or as little as you want when you're there. Um, you just sort of take contracts or take work. And if you're busy, you just say you're busy. So yeah, it was, uh, I was working at our station doing that and ended up getting an opportunity to counterplay as a senior environment artist. And they, yeah, I do that now. I, I work for both our station and counterplay. I, I juggled a pair of them, both remote. Um, both of them were actually for the most part, uh, in like NA, um, like Montreal time zones. So it actually works out quite well. It means basically my mornings I can spend on, you know, uh, one thing and then my evenings I can spend on the other. But that's, I think that's my career up to this point. It's been quite, it's been quite streaky and weird and different. And most people, I think is, it tends to be like university straight to a junior role then a mid and seeing them go like that. For me, it wasn't, I, I jumped between a lot of different things. It, it, that's the way like nearly everyone's career is. And that's why we always ask because it's, everybody has a, a different way of coming into and then progressing through the industry. And so it's always interesting to see, you know, how other people did it because we're just now getting to the point where it's like, okay, you can go to college to be a game developer, you know, but you know, until five, 10 years ago, that didn't, I would say even five years ago, that wasn't really overly viable, but so it is, it's, it's always interesting for us to find out, okay, so how did you actually end up here? You know, because those are, those are sometimes always the best story. So you're with the work that you do at art station and you'll have to tune me in because like I said earlier, I'm, I'm not an artist. Tell us what art station is and you know, why artists in the industry should be posting there. I mean, is it like deviant art or where does it fall into um, that spectrum? So essentially it's a professional artist platform. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to be professional to post on that. Everyone can post on that, but it's where people go to develop their careers, essentially um, a really good place to play, put your portfolio. And they basically give you all the tools you need to develop your career. Um, so for example, you know, by, if you're, there's like two subscription models, there's plus and pro, um, recommend like plus at least for anyone trying to get into the industry because, you know, um, you can post your work, you can post on like 4k, uh, post your videos, anything like that, organize the portfolio. And that's like the super bare minimum. That's like at a very base level, that's our station. And you can browse people's work, you know, look at what's popular right now. Um, you get art blast. So for example, where last of us has just come out. So in not too long, all the artists who worked on Last of Us will be dumping all their artwork on our station. And you get to see how the game is made, all the art goes behind it. So there's that element of our station. That's like the very basic, that's like the free, the free element of our station, which is the meat and bones of it. That's the majority of it. Um, the other elements are like, you have, a, you have the marketplace where you can post products, buy products, buy resources. Um, so for example, me, I make a lot of materials. I post all my materials on my marketplace for free. Um, simply because that's how I learned. Um, I learned by picking through other people's work and understanding it. So I do the same. And also I use bought note, bought resource. I can't resell it. So, and I'm, I can't be bothered to go back and like replace that stuff for my own stuff. So I'm like, I'll just put it for free and just not include the, uh, the outside resource. Um, but yeah, you also have blog, like the blog section. You can have your CV, um, on your R station website. Um, there's a learning section where, you know, there's all sorts of learning content on different professional pipelines taught by professionals, you know, so that's what my job is, is to reach out to professionals and say, okay, we need to like learning content on this subject. Can you create this? Can, we need learning content on this subject. Can you create that? And trying to create this really robust library of, um, learning tutorials that anyone can come to and hopefully, you know, pick up the skills they need to develop their career. And that's the whole idea is that our station is the finished package in terms of if I want to develop my career, this is the place to do it. Um, one of the things I really like is they have a challenges. So what they'll have is these big robust challenges where you have like um, 
different categories, key art, concept art, um, key shots, um, environment art, prop art, character art, animation. And all you and you can take part in these challenges and it's like a really big community event. But it's the kind of thing that if you do well on one of them, if you if you get an honorable mention, if you're a junior, if you're like trying to get into the industry and you do really well on one of them challenges, people notice like the whole industry looks at these challenges. So it's like if you get an honorable mention or even place like third, second or first, you are going to catch eyes. And it's the kind of thing you're putting yourself in a limelight on our station because the whole industry looks here like majority of like the games and film industry are here and if you're trying to if you're trying to land that job or if you're trying to progress in your career this is the place where you can really put yourself in the shop window essentially uh your mic's cut out dude <laughs> yeah i was typing and i forgot to <laughs> unmute that um I was like, that, that's so cool how they do the, the contest and things like that, because it's actually, it's it's doing more than just, okay, I'm going to post my stuff on this site because, mm -hmm. you know, sites like that can be just like, you know, I'm going to publish my game on Steam. Well, so mm -hmm. is everybody else. That's the reality. Um, so it's really cool that they do that. So have you seen an uptick in the education side or the number of stuff that's been posted since the whole COVID thing kicked off? Um, I think a lot of people have had a chance to wrap up. I mean, to be honest, our station has been pretty good for that in terms of even before all the COVID stuff, there was a really healthy amount of learning content being produced on there. Um, like even before COVID, like all of my learning took place via our station resources. People posted on there, um, you know, and when COVID, when COVID happened, I wouldn't say there's an uptake in it. I think just there's a few people managed to wrap up a few projects. They had a bit more free time on their hands. So they were able to sort of just finish up a couple of bits, but not a massive uptake. I think it's always been, um, there's always been a really good amount of stuff on there. People have always gone to our station to post their professional stuff. So, and a good way to like show how professional you are and put yourself in the limelight is to produce learning content. So it's always been, you know, there. I so. Personally, for me, I haven't noticed an uptake, but that might be because I've been in it for so long. Oh, sorry. All right, well, we got a question from chat over here from from Nightwolf. We got, uh, would putting up a custom first try portfolio or getting into challenges be best as a first step into art station? Um, I mean, it depends what you put. Like, it depends what you put up and how much time you have. You know, if you can dedicate. The next, I mean, there isn't a time limit on this stuff. So, like, it's not like you have to put something up now and otherwise, like, you missed a boat. Like, you could wait and do a challenge thing. If you think you want to pull up, you feel like represents your ability, and I'd say pull it up. Um, but the challenges offer sort of the, the unique thing about a challenge, and for me, when I've recruited people in the past, the challenge kind of is the closest thing we can get to kind of um, a a game production because you have like a time limit. You have like a, a time constriction. You have a brief you have to stick to. You have all these things like prerequisites you have to deal with. Um, so when I see an R station challenge, I, I kind of, there's a couple of things in the back of my head I don't have to worry about. With portfolio pieces uh, where they haven't got that, you could take a year developing a portfolio piece, which looks absolutely incredible. But it's like a game production, you don't have a year to focus on this one tiny little scene. Um, so I'd say if I had to choose between like looking for what's going to do better for your portfolio, a challenge or a custom portfolio piece, I say the challenge would, but that's not to say a killer portfolio piece won't put you in the shop window and get people noticing you. I hope that answers the question. I think yeah. it is. <laughs> It's like us. It's like we ramble on and then we go, did we actually cover what that person <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, if, if you're out there listening, we are, we switched to new tech. So we are still trying to get Mixer back up again. But we're on Twitch and Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube right now. If you've got a question, post it in chat because we see all of it. And, you know, we'll, we'll grill Alex on it, you know, once it comes in there. Um, so, I mean, are there any best practices? I mean, in putting stuff up there on art station. I mean, aside from doing the challenges, how does a freelance artist go about effectively promoting themselves? 
It's just a weird thing in the art industry. I don't know. I have no idea why, but people are shy to just share their stuff. Like, so for example, me, I'm, I'm very outspoken on this. I'm very um, bullish when I come to it. I'm like, when I post a new piece of artwork, I'll post on my Facebook page. I'll post into like five or six different Facebook groups. I'll put it on Twitter. I'll put it on LinkedIn, my Instagram. Uh, I'll post it into Discord. Because at the end of the day, this is like, if this was a business, if I had a business, I'd promote the hell out of it because it's my career. This is my life. My art is the exact same. My art is my career and it's my business. So it's kind of like when I do something new, I want to tell the world I've done something new. So if you do stuff, pr tell people you did it. Like there's no point just posting on art station and only operating an art station. Because especially if you have no following on there, if you need to build a following and you're only posting on an art station, the only people who are going to stumble across your work is sheer luck. It's like if you put on all your social media too, and I mean, not just like one time, you know, Facebook, all the different groups. So it's like this 10K, 8 level, um, there's like the Quixel groups and the substance groups. Post your work and pull it everywhere and just try to get as much eyes on it as possible. Because, mm -hmm. worst case scenario, even if like it's not up to scratch, the more people to see your work, the art, the, the art community is a very caring industry um, and community. They will feedback and they'll critique your work. Like if it's not up to scratch, they'll tell you and they will give you the feedback and the guidance you need to move forward. And then that's happened with me a bunch in the past. I've posted work and people will give their two cents on it. And like, okay, I can I know that going forward. So I think the main thing is like actually tell people when you've done stuff. Don't just put on art station or put it wherever, whatever your portfolio is. I mean, I recommend art station. Uh and that's not because I work also, this is not because I work for them. I've been saying this for years. Because there's nothing worse than getting a Wix portfolio or like a Squarespace portfolio. And I spend more time trying to navigate it or critiquing the UI or UX than I do looking at the artwork. That always happens. I get a Squarespace website and I'm looking at the website and the design rather than the artwork. Whereas with ArtStation, because everything's the exact same, the layout's the exact same for everybody, people only talk about the artwork. Um yeah, that'd be my biggest advice is just tell people you've done stuff. Don't don't just post it and then go quiet. Like tell the world what you've done, share it across your social media and interact with artists as well. Like, you know, a big a really good like way to grow your like your circle of your, your network and your, the people you have relationships with is to talk to them. Go join Discord communities, talk to artists, get to know people. Like over the past few years, I've got three or four real tight knit friendship circles of artists who I can post work to and get critique and feedback and I get real solid feedback from them. Um, and that's been my main, the main catalyst to my career growing has been them. Not necessarily the stuff I'm doing off my own back in my own time. It's the people I interact with who help me. That's where all the growth is. That's, all, that's always where you get the best feedback. And it's like we tell folks, it's like you can't show your game or what have you to your to your friends and to your mom because they're going to tell you it looks great whether it actually does or not it's it's not usually that reliable but you i think as an industry you know there are a lot of folks that are more introverted and especially when it comes to you know showing art or something like that where there is such a a meaningful effort that's been put into it people can get you know, a little antsy about posting it up that first time and, you know, being afraid of that feedback. And there's not really, I mean, it's, it's like posting the work from your game in general. There's not really a way to soften that blow. You know, you just have to go out there and do it. But if you, you have, really have to learn to get some thick skin. Yeah. Oh yeah. You, you have to do a thick skin. But the one thing I would say, coming back to your point, we said, you know, you share your friends and family because all they do is say, oh, that's nice. To me, that's more of a, a indicator of how good your friends, how high quality your friends are. The guys I show my art to who are in my friendship circle, they are some of my best friends. Like they're the guys I speak to every single day. We're tight, but I have posted work in the past and they've messaged me or they've in a group gone, Alex, that isn't good. Like that isn't your standard. Like you're better than this. And I have to leave the work and redid it and had to post it again. Like if your friends just tell you what you want to hear, they're like, it's like popcorn friends. They don't really, they don't care. Like, they don't care about your long-term happiness. They're just there to keep you happy in the short term. Like the guys I interact with, the people I call my friends in these like tight knit groups, 
every single one of them will call me out if I do something daft. It, like they listen to every podcast, and if I do something stupid, they're like, eh, "You said something a bit sketchy there. Or I didn't agree with what you said there. I think you need to explain yourself better next time." Whereas family's a bit different. Family's, you know, fair enough. They don't understand the industry, so whatever they're just going to say. If I show my mum a pretty picture, she says it's a pretty picture. <laughs> um, however, there is something else to that. So, they, like, my I remember my art lecturer um, at college doing traditional drawing. I drew a lot of monsters um, and like sci-fi stuff, and he went, "I can't critique that. No matter what I say, it's your little fantasy world, and I can't say shit." He was like, "However, if you want to get better at." draw your draw your mum's mobile phone and show her that because she could tell you whether that looks like her mobile phone or not like she don't need an art major or like to be a games artist to understand if it looks like real life um and that translates to um the material i do a lot of materials it's been funny because there's been a couple of images and i can show my mum or my uh my mother-in-law and be like this here and if they go Oh, I thought that was real life. Now, obviously, they're being either flattering or they don't know what to look for to tell if it's real or not. But it's the exact same thing. You can get, you can find feedback in nearly every single person. You just got to know how to get it and what you got to show people. But yeah, just to that point of the, the the friends thing, like your friends should be okay with telling you when you've done some shit. Like if they, if they're not, then they're not there to look out for you. And that might be harsh. I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I, I mean, it, it's standard. not. It because that's the the same way you know, I am, the, you know, it's one of those that I had to develop thick skin and anyone, I mean, quite frankly, anybody who does business in this industry has to develop thick skin because, you know, we're, we're going to send a game out to 150 different publishers and a hundred of them are going to tell us it sucks. You know, 50 of them will not say that, but it's one of those things that I see a lot of developers and, you know, their friends or the safe space in which they, you know, share stuff is not like you said, not that kind of friend, not the one that's going to give them the hard feedback that they need a lot of times. And so it, it, that is a very good point to bring up because, you know, you're the people in your circle. I don't want to say your true friends because your true friends could be, you know, helping you with all sorts of things in life, not necessarily critiquing your work, but the ones who, you know, really want to see you improve are going to be the ones that give you honest feedback. The question that I always have as someone who's not an artist is how do you, now I get it. If, if you're like drawing your mom's phone, okay, that either looks like her phone or it doesn't, you know, that's, but when you're get into, especially in our industry where you've got fantasy creatures or sci-fi monsters or all kinds of, you know, other things out there how do you create how do you critique that in the sense of okay that's good art or bad art or versus okay that looks nothing like you're you know you're wanting to to display because i know when developers bring stuff to me I'm like how do you like the art style in this i can go i like it or i don't like it but i can't give them that deeper level of feedback on okay, maybe you should try this shader or this lighting or the, cause I don't know that shit. So how has to be grounded in reality, I think that's where it comes in. Like if I've seen a lot of sci so start with sci-fi, sci-fi is a good place to start. It's some of the best. So there's a guy, uh, Matthew Halloran, a really great um, environment artist at Ubisoft Toronto now. Um, he does a lot of like uh, industrial, like mech design and car designs and stuff like this. And the reason they look so great is he has a solid understanding of how the real world works, how the real world designs these big mechanical structures. So that when he designs his elements, he's you, he's drawing from a place of reality. Now the same can be applied with sci-fi. Um, obviously, there's all there's a lot of things that come into it: color theory, composition. But if you can explain, like, so this one we I used to someone told me once for one of my scenes, like. You have a bunch of light sources. How are they powered? Okay, they're powered like underneath paneling. Fine, the, the, the cables and stuff are hidden underneath paneling. Okay, where's the entry point if I want to do maintenance on them? How are they attached to the wall? And you answer these kinds of questions that you'd have to actually go to to like assemble this place in the real world. Suddenly you start filling in the blocks yourself. So the exact same thing could be applied when I, if I'm looking at a piece of art. I, is it believable? Do I believe this space? Do I believe humans could function in this space and live in this space? 
Um, when you get to more the fantasy side of stuff and the organic fantasy, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to suggest a lot of stuff to people. You have to, uh, you know, you're operating with no point of reference. So you have to create points of references. Um, there's a really good station learning course on this, and it's, that's not a shameless plug. Um, where he's this basically whole show is shameless plugs, Alex. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we did, they did. He basically was doing like graphical sketches, like uh, thumbnails, like small sketched thumbnails. And one of the things he said, he was drawing like um, this big like landscape where like you're looking over this valley, and he's explaining like there's no point of reference to this. I have no idea what the scale is. Okay, I need to add these trees up here and the exact same tree over in the distance to give you a sense of scale. And these are the kinds of things you need to just inform the person looking at the art so that they can, you know, because sometimes you have to fill in blanks and it's really difficult. Like if you just show somebody this really crazy alien organic landscape and you have no point of reference, it's just kind of like, yes or no. I, ha I have nowhere to draw from. So you have to introduce elements that feel familiar, that the person could put themselves into. Speaking only from environments, by the way, because that's my, my area of expertise. You have to put elements in there that allow people to, um, you know, visualize the space and understand it. Now, the more you talk to artists, so for example, if you're a developer, it might be more difficult and you might have to put more reference in, in there for them. If you're speaking to artists, you can get more and more vague and they can interpret more and more. So obviously it depends on who you're showing the artwork to. Like if you show an art director, they will be able to fill these gaps and answer these questions really quickly and figure it out like that. But like if you show a developer, like you might have to, you have to visually explain stuff more to them um, or your average person, not just a developer. So that's the, to answer the question, it's all about can, to critique something and look at something and understand it, if I can understand it as a person of a from a place of ignorance and still make sense of it, you've probably done a good job of the design. Then you get onto composition and all that stuff, and that's a whole different ballpark. Okay, we got another question there from Nightwolf. Uh, how do you make something original without having it be seen as influenced by or similar to something else, even if you do not know the subject? Same with making fan art as your own for your portfolio. So... I've done this. I've, so I've got a piece of my portfolio called Cerberus. Um, and the whole point of it is a 3D environment uh, based off um, a fantastic concept by Giles Ketting. And it is like, I've tried to get it as one-to-one -one from the port, from the concept to mine. Reason being is I'm trying to answer a question. Um, every single piece I do, I'm answering a question. I'm showcasing a skill or a, something that I can do for someone looking at my portfolio. So with that one in particular, it was... Um, that in AAA, if the art director sits down with his pre-production team for a year and a half, designing an environment and a space and a mood, my job as an environment artist is to take that and replicate it in 3D. That was the whole point of that scene. That's all I wanted to show people. Um, now, as for being like the, the first part of the question, you should be influenced by things, but be influenced by real world things, you know, it's very, it's a very risky game. It's something I did early on in my career, um, like reference game art. I'd, I'd, on my reference board, I'd have like lots of game art props. Now, game art props are an interpretation of the real world. So by me referencing that, it's an interpretation of an interpretation. And it's like Chinese whispers. Eventually, it's, it's, it's a diluted message. So there's nothing wrong with being influenced. And you can take reference from people who have done, you know, clever workflows, um, interesting techniques, interesting lighting setups. There's no nothing wrong with references someone, um, but always acknowledge it. Like um, that would do the concept by Giles Ketting. I will tag him in the piece and be like, "Hey, this is I did this piece, but it was inspired by this person. It was this person's original concept." There's nothing wrong with referencing um, or being influenced by other artists at all. We have to influence each other because we learn from each other. There's another question coming in, too, from uh, the Earthman. Uh, we have to deal with politically correctness more and more, I think. I mean, more than a few years ago. Do you think so as well? I got to just gotta be more aware that we can't be dicks in a workplace. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're in a workplace. Like, does it, you can moan about like, political correctness all you want. Like, in a workplace, the company dictates everything. Like, it doesn't matter what you think. If the company says you can't say something, you don't, you're getting paid by them, so you do as you're told. Um, 
are people a little bit more sensitive now? Are people more like likely to voice their concerns? Yeah, of course they are. You've got social media, you know, everyone has a voice. Um, is it a problem? I think things can get blown up. I think the issue you have, so where the issue does lie is things being taken out of context with political correctness. I, so this is why, for example, with my podcast and you guys are doing it now, nothing can be taken out of context because it's all recorded, no editing. I see in social media, things get taken out of context and someone misinterprets a message and then that gets blown up and then suddenly this person's like the equivalent to Hitler. And it's like, okay, clearly that's bad. That's obvious. But misinformed information being spread is always bad. Like it's been not unique to just now. It's always been the case. So yeah, political correctness is more common now, but at the same time, like don't say stupid shit on the internet and you, you're fine. Don't say stupid shit in general and you'll be fine. That's <laughs> the, um, it's like rule number one of our discord. Don't be a dick. Just don't. That's, that's, that's it. Yeah. The, um, so, I mean, let's talk, real quick about networking because that's one of the points that you talked about before we got started on the show is it's important for artists and everybody in the industry especially if you're doing freelance to network but networking isn't always the same everywhere so what are some of the things that that you do to to stand out a little bit you know about, uh, you know when you're doing your art or you're looking for gigs or, or what have you what what are some of the other ways that you can network um so i suppose on a small tangent i i, I sent off out to you guys i i hate the word networking in a presentation i give to university students i have a slide with the word networking struck through and it says relationships under um this came from it's funny what so at my time of life this is one of the things i really got from life five um dealing with clients can be difficult and customers and i used to get very infuriated i'd have a design in my head and i'm like worked out for like the past six months we pitched a client and client wants to change a bunch of stuff and i'm like oh, jesus christ i know i'm the expert i know what i'm talking about and my ceo used to always say to me so alex it doesn't matter cause it's just about relationships and it used to really piss me off because every time i'd be like that's the wrong decision and he's like yeah you're right but alex it's about relationships and he'd say that to me every day i said to my creative director and i used to get infuriated by it but now I realize it's kind of like, he's right. Like sometimes it's about maintaining a relationship. Now, obviously, so with me as, as an example, I didn't start the podcast to network. Um, I started a podcast because I, from a selfish reason, I wanted to just talk to people. I wanted to learn how people um, perceive the world, how they perceived art. And it's just so happened completely unintentionally. It's actually a really good networking tool because I meet a bunch of people. I build relationships with a bunch of people at any point. Anyone who's been on podcasts, I could probably shoot them a DM and ask them a question. And they're nine times out of 10 be willing to help. Um, that's networking, building relationship. Um, and the same goes for what we were talking about earlier. There's friendship circles. I have some really close friends who are all in the industry and I haven't networked with them. They're my friends. I have a, a genuine one-to-one -one relationship with these guys. Um, that's how you build your network and build your career because also the industry is a small place. You know, everyone knows everyone. So if I've, you know, I'm consciously interacting with people, building these relationships, lay it down a line and I'm like, okay, I need a gig. I, I'm looking for something. I have this big pool of people who I can talk to and say, hey, do you know anybody? Because everybody knows somebody and you can play that game. But it all starts with actually having a genuine relationship with them. And that doesn't mean you So this is the biggest P for me. People go into LinkedIn just connecting. Like every day I open LinkedIn, I've got four or five connection requests with no message, nothing. And <laughs> I, I, I'll accept. Be nuts. <laughs> yeah, and I'll accept and I'll sit and wait. I'll be like, I'll accept and I'll leave it there. I'm like, okay, are we going to say anything? And I can't really do it anymore because I'm a bit too busy for it. But I used to, like last year, if someone just shot me a, a connection and didn't say anything, I would give it a couple of days and then I would message them and be like, hey, you connected, if I can help you with. And I, I mean, I can't do that now, but it's like, that's not networking and you're not doing anything for your career by doing that. It's All you're doing is collecting Pokemon cards. I've heard, a few people have said that in the past and I'm stealing that quote. But it's like, you're not collecting Pokemon cards. You're trying to build relationships with people. You are instantly forgotten. As soon as they press accept on that, your name and you don't say anything, you're forgotten. They don't know who you are. So 
if you're trying to grow a network, talk to the person, get to know them, and be transparent while you're talking to them. Like, um, if I connect a couple of years ago, I'd connect with a lead artist at like multiple studios. I'd say, hey, I'm connected because one day I would love to work for your studio. And I think it's best if I connect with you, I can see what you're doing and keep in touch. Nothing wrong with being transparent. They're not, they, they are there for the same reason. You're not there to make new best friends. You're there for business. So being transparent on that is really useful. So, so how, how has the podcast helped? So you've been doing the podcast for like a year now. So what sort of feedback and what sort of extra reach has that given you? Um, reach, I, I'm not sure. Can't say I don't pay too much attention to the analytics too much. Like, because like I said, it's a purely selfish thing. I just want to speak to people. Um, I know I have had a few people say in the past, I talk a lot on the podcast. Um, mainly because it's a conversation. It's a, it's not an interview. I'm, I want to have a conversation with a person. Uh, that's how I run my podcast is, you know, it is what it is. Uh, that's something I hear quite a lot. But it doesn't work. like it's been, it's helped my career so much. Like it's been, it's how I got my De- Decagon gig. It's how I started meeting the art station guys. I got that gig. It's how I got to know some of the guys at Counterplay. Um, it's led to a ton of freelance gigs uh, through people where like I've had a good conversation with them and we speak now like off air quite a lot. And they'll be like, "Hey, I've had this gig come my way, but I haven't got time for it. Do you want it?" And it's like, "Yeah, sure, I'll take it up." Um, so that's been like the sort of unintentional um side of the podcast now i someone's i remember telling someone this story and they're like yeah but i can't just start a podcast like that not everybody can start a podcast i don't yeah you gotta be creative like um there's a guy called ken who started uh, the experience points um website which is like for articles and stuff and he's just started a podcast as well actually funny enough but now he, he people know who ken is because he started this really good resource for the community timothy drives he, he writes these really good blog posts um just talking about game game art stuff again he's grew his his brand and people know him more from just his art his art they know him because he's a he's a value to the community tim simpson like he's so he's actually my art director but he has a youtube channel he did this great series for and actually if you want to know what the art station challenges are all about go watch his series he basically documented him doing the art station challenge for feudal japan and he's just showing okay i'm a senior lighting artist at the time I'm going to show you how I work. I'm going to show you how I create a scene and all this. And he's narrated it's like four or five parts. And by being that value to the community, his whole brand grows and everyone's brand grows. So you'll be creative on how you do this stuff. Like not everybody could just start a podcast. Not everyone could just start an article website. But these people who did this have figured out creative ways to be a value to the, to the industry. I mean, really easy off the bat. If you really wanted something simple, Put stuff up on the marketplace, make tutorials. Like, really, everyone can do that. That's not unique. It's not like you can have too many tutorials. So, that's what my big advice to that is. And that's what podcast has done for me is I've just been able to creatively get to know more people and grow my network. And when I say network, like I said, I hate it because they're not, it's not a network. They're people I have relationships with, they're genuine people. The, the same could be true if we are hold on i just completely lost that train of thought right in the middle of it going online and you know starting a stream where you're actually doing your art live and 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 Mm -hmm. getting feedback like that you say you can't start a podcast but it's really really easy to start a podcast or a stream i mean you literally only need to sign up getting it out there is the hard part but yeah for a lot of folks you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing because when they first get going and they want to, you know, start learning how to do it and get comfortable either being, you know, live on, on Twitch or Mixer or YouTube or whatever, or if they are, you know, on their podcast, they kind of want to get their feet under them first. And so it's really not that bad, but, you know, you really can. And it's a great way to get feedback is if you, you just go out there and say, hey, look, I'm going to do art and this is what I use. And those tutorials are, are wonderful. That's how this channel started. We were doing tutorials. We were just doing tutorials for business, you know, instead of mm-hmm. art and things like that. So, you know, yeah, I agree. It, it, it is all about, you know, 
like you said, it's not really spreading that network. It is spreading the network, but you're also opening yourself up to, you know, the opportunities to, to meet more of these people and have these relationships and things. Mm -hmm. like that. I mean, there's a lot of folks that I wouldn't have known if we had never started doing what we do. So mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Um, did we have another question? Yeah, there's a, another question from Node Neil over here. Uh, this is a good one. Hi, Alex. What do you think about, I don't know how to say that, phot 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 photogrammetry. Photogrammetry, phot photogrammetry and the momentum it has right now. On top, there's UE5 coming out that can take it insane amounts of polys. Do you think studios are going to really start making the most out of this crazy new tech? And will it ever become standard? So... In my mind, photogrammetry she's already kind of standard. Like you look at the games over the past two years, they've all leveraged photogrammetry in one way. In fact, over the past four years, it's leveraged photogrammetry in one way or another. It, they're not one hundred percent photogrammetry. Um, UE five is a funny one uh, because if I look at like Unreal Engine four now, all of the really fancy bells and whistles that are in there don't make it to game production because it's too expensive. So all the fancy bells and whistles we saw with Unreal Engine 5, it'll be interesting to see how much of that translates into, into an actual game production. Because once you start throwing AI in there and gameplay and you know a whole you know whole level and all these kind of things, it'll be curious to see how that plays out. But yeah, with photogrammetry, it's um I think it's just gonna become another way of doing things. Like if we look at like um what's a good example? A star citizen versus like the hunt showdown. Like one needs uniques, the other uses face weight normals. It's like it's two different ways to skin a cat. Um I think photogrammetry is just gonna become another tool in the tool belt of a game developer to create things. But I think it's already pretty mainstream. Like I don't think it's like this rare thing that barely anyone's doing. Like the majority of the games in this the triple A games industry is leveraging it one way or another. There's still a couple who haven't who choose not to, and that's fair enough. But um yeah, even if it's something as simple as well, like, you know, taking high scan data and using it as a basis to build your material, like using it as a start point, but then you do use Substance Designer to kind of keep building on top of that, which is what's been going on since like the first Shadow of Mordor game. That's already there. So like we're already using photogrammetry in the industry. I think you'll it's here to stay if, if that helps wrap up the question. Yeah, I think it's already pretty standard. So... Uh I had to check my my mic was on. As again, as someone who is not an artist, I look at things like photogrammetry, and it, to me, it's just like wizardry. It's like, okay, hold on a second. We can just take a, a photo and we're going to drop it in here, and this is going to be textures on everything now. How much of these advances in things like Unreal 5 make it to the majority of the industry and how much of it is stuff that at the end of the day is only going to be used by these massive multi-hundred people, triple A teams. Um, I think, I think that it's one thing to bear in mind is that Unreal Engine isn't just for games. That's something to be very aware of. And what, so the big exciting thing for Unreal Engine 5 is not for games. Like I still think probably about 40% of the stuff we've seen in Unreal, Unreal Engine 5 make it to AAA games. Um, the thing that's exciting is real-time movies and, you know, um, ArchViz and these other industries. Like Unreal Engine is not unique to games. So all these great advancements which are coming and like visual fidelity and all this kind of stuff, the real kick out which people should be excited about is what's going to do for film industry um it makes it far more accessible it makes it far quicker to turn a movie around now obviously it's not the same as an offline renderer um but the gap is closing very 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 quickly um yeah it doesn't what's going to make it into like you know for triple a i still think it's going to be 40 percent. and also there's like there's still test beds like unreal engine 4 is still growing even now and <laughs> as much as people like to meme on um fortnite Fortnite's been the test bed for a lot of the cool tech that's come into Unreal Engine 4 over the past couple of years. So it's kind of it's going to be the exact same. It's Unreal Engine 5 will start at a point, and I'd say like 40% of it, 50% of it won't even be usable in AAA games. But over the course of its lifespan and its life cycle over a couple of years, the technology will be refined and we'll work out how we can leverage it and how we can use it. Um but yeah, just when you see these taglines like billions of polys on screen 
it's kind of misleading because it's probably actually like just visible lots and all that kind of stuff. They haven't explained it and shown how it works. But what we'll say, the thing that was impressive about that, like that UE5 demo was really impressive, was the fact that it's running on a console. Nearly every single tech demo you see is always on this monster tech, you know, SLI Titan machine. And this wasn't, this was a PS5. Like that was something that was pretty impressive. It wasn't, there's no hiding that. It was on a PS5, it was on a console. So no matter how good it looks and people want to throw out, like myself saying that it won't make it into AAA games, it was still running on a console and that's impressive in itself. What I think is awesome is that uh, The Mandalorian, a lot of that stuff was shot on a green yeah. screen and uh, backgrounds were done in Unreal. That's yeah. my client. It's like, so, you, I, I didn't even know. I mean, I thought, oh yeah, some of the sets, but then once you watch it and then... Uh, mm-hmm. I, after I read that, I was like, oh, wow, that's that's pretty amazing. All right, we got a couple of other questions here. Nightwolf, for functionality versus art skill in an end product, would it be better slash easier to make a final product in Unity than in Unreal, seeing as Unreal Extras may bypass system requirements for the wanted product? I'm going to be super biased here. I'm sorry for people who use Unity. Make it Unreal. Unreal, you have so many more tools. I think the graphical fidelity is there. I will say there are some people making stuff in Unity, which looks fantastic. Like um, Jarese Yang, I know I've just butchered his second name. Jarese makes really just amazing art in Unity. So you can achieve a like good graphical fidelity at the end using Unity. But I think Unreal is quicker to get there. Something to bear in mind with your portfolio is... There's not a portfolio piece out there which is matching AAA game limitations. You know, I look at mine. I've you know, all my props have a 2K unique texture on it. My whole scene is using these 4K tardables. You don't get that luxury in AAA games. You have to be very clever and you have to be very um, stingy with all the resource you have. So with your portfolio pieces, like bear in mind limitations but show you can do the thing. So show I can understand color theory, composition. Um, I can build a prop from beginning to end. I could build a trim sheet from beginning to end. Okay, yeah, maybe the end product is a bit too high res or, you know, not matching the resolution that the games industry operates in. But for me hiring you, I can at least see you know that skill and pipeline. And you can execute it to a really high fidelity. In AAA, we'll just dial that fidelity back a little bit and just be a little bit more clever with it. But... Between Unity and Unreal, I, I mean, it might also be because I'm biased. I've learned, I've been in Unreal for the past, like, 10 years. I've only used Unity for, like, VR projects. Um, I, I, I'm pretty hard, I'm a pretty diehard Unreal f- fanboy. So, Indy, you brought up a good point. The team that did a lot of the work on The Mandalorian is actually a client of ours. And so I want to get them on the show and we'll talk about it because I, I remember I sat down and they were showing me what they did. They, in their sizzle reel, I could see somebody working with Oculus with the handsets. And, and I went, just wait, hold on. Wait a second. Are you actually building the set in VR? And they're like, yeah, all the stuff that we do with the set pieces, it's not like they're just sitting at the computer creating these locations they're doing it in vr and then manually placing everything like you would it, it's fucking amazing it's, well it's- just on that one of the guys on on learning um probably works who worked on the mandalorian has a course using gravity sketch so using vr to make something one of our courses by collie is who worked on the mandalorian is exactly that it's using vr to sculpt these spaceships and yes stuff. It's crazy. So if you want to see it, go there. Go check it out. So, are are the courses on ArtStation free, or do you charge for them? You have to. You have to be a. Uh, so this is we've gone with like a subscription model. So if you have Plus, so okay, uh, I suppose I could do the plug. Um, with Plus, you get access to the whole learning library. Uh, Plus is like I think it's six dollars a month. Super cheap compared to like some of the other tutorial websites. So you get access to learning. You get access to a blog space. Uh, you can put your res- your CV on your art station. You get um, access to like a custom website. I mean, it's, for all the stuff you get, it's a pretty good price. Like I like I said in my presentation to university students, uh, before I worked at art station, there was a slide dedicated to just go get an art station um, plus subscription. It gives you all the tools you need to develop your career. Now the pro subscription is good. It, it like allows you to make money on art station using the marketplace a little bit more. Um, has a few other nice bells and whistles, but in terms of just, I need to get into the industry. 
go get plus like all the stuff you need to grow your career is in r station plus and go get it and i've said that before i worked at r station so that is not just because i worked there right, so we alex has got a meeting coming up so we got about five ten minutes if you've got any other questions about you know art and learning and all of this sort of stuff then absolutely pop it in chat and let's get it answered before we go let's talk about your podcast so <laughs> You know, I came across your podcast earlier this week and, you know, reached out. Tell us about the podcast and because we, you know, we've talked about it already, but what do you discuss? Who do you have on there? How often do you do it and where can people find it? So the podcast is uh, Game Dev Discussion or GDD. Um, it's the official podcast of the Dynasty Learning Community. Um it's a weekly podcast it's been i've managed i've not missed a week yet so since february last year it's been an episode a week um and essentially i get game developers on and not just game developers but people in you know related to the games industry or people can learn from so for example um i'll get programmers on i'll get concept artists on people who own who are involved in software development because they all affect game artists and the whole idea is we have just a long form conversation about so we just talk you know it's it's not an interview uh so like what like i said earlier people said oh I, you talk quite a lot during the podcast i'm like yeah because it's a conversation um and yeah the whole idea is we will i'll try to dive in and I, with the podcast i always try to get past the superficial like surface level stuff and dive into what makes them think how they why they do stuff they like their take on new things coming up um, some of the best ones I've done recently, there's a guy called Josh Lynch, a real big figure in the material art community. And we've talked about real, like, heavy stuff, like burnout for artists, um, dealing with, like, his, the career progression, like, once you reach senior, like, the, the plateau you get to and how to overcome that. Um, and I've started get doing, I've started a new series on it as well called Insert Topic, which is, is a, is a I get three artists on, and we just, there's a subject matter, and we just discuss it. So I've done three episodes so far. The first one was me and a, uh, one people from like a, a group of friends, and we're just discussing Unreal Engine Five. The, the, we just watched the update and we just talked about it for an hour. Uh, the other, what the second one was freelancers. I got three artists on who I freelance with in the past, and we just talked about being a freelancer and the troubles of it, the pros, cons, and the one which just went up um, yesterday was women in games. We discussed some of the issues still facing women in games and they, they told their stories and, you know, hopefully get put some of these stuff in the spotlight so people can learn from it. Um, yeah, it's every week. It goes up every Thursday on like all the platforms, YouTube, uh, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes everywhere. Um, yes. Yeah, long form conversations of artists. So we're going to hit this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Dave. All right. Night Wolf. It's got a couple questions right here. Um, how do you go about using others' assets on ArtStation for lighting, level design, and animation? Free use or bot license? And then as follow-up question, do you need to state which programs you use if you're if you are using student hobby trial versions of the program, or does it matter? So, on your ArtStation, um, start with the the follow-up question. I think it's the best place to start. You can list what software you've used. I recommend you telling people what software you use. So for example, if I click on one of my environments, I'd be like, I use ZBrush, Substance Painter, Substance Designer, and Unreal Engine. For anyone viewing that post, I come to that and I'm like, right, I know who can use that. I know who can use that. Great. I know everything I need to know. Um, I think he's asking if you'd have to say if you're using the student hobby or a trial. Doesn't version. matter. It doesn't matter. If you if it's if you're not selling it, it's fine. If it's on your portfolio and you used, I mean, even if you use a cracked version, you're not selling it. Like just don't don't sell it if you use the trial version, but if this is going on your art station and this is you showing your skill, it doesn't matter if it's a trial or a student version. Um, to your first point, it is completely fine to use other people's assets. Um, the games industry, you are not responsible for absolutely everything in the game. Um, one of my favorite scenes I've done, the safe house scene, I contacted an, a weapon artist and asked, look, I'm not a weapons artist. Could I use a gun you made if your art station and put it into my scene? Uh, I did. It, it helped the scene because I'm not a weapons artist. I didn't want to invest all that time into doing something to not a good enough level to match my material and environment skills. Um, so yeah, put a, put a weapon in there, and obviously you give your the, the proper accreditations. So in the description, I'm like, okay, this you know this is a scene I made. 
thank you to uh, I think it's Anchor who let me use his um, like ragtag AK set. As I thank you to Anchor for letting me use these weapons. Here's a link to his profile. Go check him out. So it's completely fine to use the assets in your portfolio. Just state that you did it. It's the exact same with using mega scans. It's okay to use mega scans from Quixel. Just state that you did it. Because if you try to pass it off as your own, it's just not on. Like that's a no go. In every aspect is not an excuse for it. That's quite an easy question to answer. The question is, you know, do you, do you go and you credit the actual person's name, or is it like, hey, thank you for this weapon from Dank Meme sixty nine sixty nine? The um, uh, they'll all have proper names on our station. If you've got them from like Gumroad or Art Station or anywhere, they'll have proper names to give them proper creditations. That's awesome because that always. I always look around and I'm like, I don't even know how to pronounce that handle. It's like, I can't, <laughs> I can't help you there. But that said, and then like the one that I use when I play games is one that no one can pronounce either. And I always find it hilarious to listen to them. Uh, I don't, we, I know you got to go, you got a meeting, Alex, thank you so much. You know, folks check out art station, especially if you can get tutorials and you can learn all this stuff for six bucks a month. I mean, that is nothing that is fantastic uh and check out you know his podcast as well we'll put all the links into you know the post once all this stuff goes live and on the podcast as well um but yeah any any parting words alex no thank you for having me on this has been fun um yeah if you if you guys haven't please you know go check out the podcast because and try to share it around us because especially ones like this, any podcast, because the more the people can hear this sort of information, the better, because it's, it's going to help somebody somewhere. Excellent. <laughs> Make sure uh, you can join our Discord, discord.gg slash Indie Game Business, and, of course, listen to all of these past streams at anchor.fm slash Indie Game Business. And what's the link to yours, Alex, your podcast? Uh, if you search just Game Dev Discussion to Spotify or YouTube, it'll come up, just Game Dev Discussion. Excellent. I don't think that's it. Unless you have anything else you want to talk about real quick, no, Jay? Everybody, you know, it's it's Juneteenth here in the U.S. And not, well, I guess in a lot of the rest of the world, too. Go out, learn something today. Be kind to each other. Don't be a dick. And have a good weekend. I think we completely lost Indy. No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, oh. <laughs> and it's dark all of a sudden. <laughs> all right, everybody. Now we're leaving. All right. See ya. See you guys.